Uh, wonderful. So now I have the uh, the privilege of, of introducing uh, our next speaker, uh, Tom Fairbairn. Uh, Tom is the Distinguished Engineer at Solus. Uh, good morning, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your introduction, Carl. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about event API products. And uh, for those of you that are watching Patrick's session previously, he kind of started to touch upon the whole idea of events there. So we're going to talk about that a little more. Uh, it's a little bit of a change to um, the title there. Apologies for that, but I really don't have time to fit in my five lessons learned. Maybe that's a, a, a subject for another discussion. Okay. Tom, if you your screen, the, the, the stage is yours. Uh, great. Thanks very much. Uh, I think I am sharing my screen already. Okay, there we go. Next. Yep, lovely. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. <clears throat> So yeah, thanks everyone. Um, my job as a distinguished engineer here really is to help people understand this whole idea of event-driven architectures and how they might apply to their business problems. Um, kind of a discussion at API Days today, uh, rather like Patrick mentioned previously, is that uh, kind of event-driven and API-driven are really they're not they're they're complementary, and we'll talk about that a bit more. So let's get into this subject of. Um, event API products, what are they? How do they relate to API products? Hopefully as kind of API experts here, we understand what an API product is. <clears throat> Let's see how we can apply that to the event driven part of this. Uh, you've got a view there from Patrick there with uh, this webhook idea. <clears throat> What's another view of this? And we'll talk about how you might create these API products, what they might look like, what some of the use cases might be. Um, and then I'm gonna kind of segue into Solace's product um, this event pops up plus event portal and show you how it's done there. Okay, let's get started. So, okay, what are API products? Um, so if you look at this from the analyst point of view, um, everybody likes Gartner, right? Um, really, it's a way of bundling up a collection of APIs, or if you think about it, kind of abilities, into a single business focused capability, okay? So you may have an API that's, that, that fulfills a particular um, a technical requirement. So if you're used to, the, for instance, the MuleSoft way of explaining this is around um, system APIs and experience APIs, right? It's about bundling those lower level technical capabilities together to form a coherent whole that addresses a specific business requirement, right? Um, and I think we're used to delivering this in the synchronous web-based API world, right? Um, and if you think about it, what you're doing there is you're taking this specific technical API and, and really you're creating something from that that delivers longer term value, right? This is, could be something, for instance, that you're going to monetize, you're going to sell to third parties. Um, and in that case, um, obviously you're deriving more value for it, but you're going to have a life cycle associated with that API. And that's an important point because now we're into the business part, right? We need a product manager for this. We need a roadmap. We need to be able to communicate this roadmap with their customers. We need a price. We need to lifecycle manage it so that if a developer decides that they want to change a specific system level API that's part of our API product, right? We've got to govern that correctly to make sure that it doesn't interfere with our product. And how do we deliver these things? Well, we have a developer portal, right? So we have the API gateway as the runtime layer. And we have a developer portal on top of that, which is the place at which we, at developer time, build the API. And then that's where we might share it and start actually publishing that as an API product. So kind of to summarize then, if you look at the, the top-down view of these, what's an API product? Well, it's basically a way of bundling together your existing capabilities so that you can expose it to others at a business level. Okay, hmm. how does this fit in with the event-driven world then? If you looked at uh, Patrick's previous, uh, previous uh, discussion, he was talking about how you may emit asynchronous updates. Um, in his particular example, it's a, uh, a webhook. That's not the only way to do it. The key point here is first of all, this idea of asynchronous. So, your normal uh, API driven way, right, is that I, as a consumer of the API, I'm going to call you, I'm going to request something for, from you. In the event driven world, and if you think about Patrick's webhook example, it's the other way around. I, as a producer of this API, once I have something that I need to give to you, I'm going to give it to you. So it's a push model, I'm gonna push 
this event towards you. How do we do that? Well, it's this publish subscribe model. Okay, so I as a consumer, rather than calling an API, I'm going to say, I'm interested in these events. And then you're going to have a, a, an infrastructural layer that's responsible for accepting those events from whoever's sending them and then pushing them out to all of the consumers. Now, we've had this a long time in industry. If you think about uh, um, the, you know, one of the first use cases of this is your, your typical stock exchange right there. We don't send in an API request to find out what the latest prices are. The latest prices are pushed to you over a market data feed, say, on your website. But what we haven't really had to this point is this product view, this developer portal view. So how are we going to all tie this together? Well, let's think about the typical case. So everybody loves e-commerce, so let's talk about that. Imagine I, as a customer, I'm going to talk to my e-commerce site. I'm going to talk to an order management platform. So, well, that sounds like an excellent case for uh, an API, right? I'm going to place an order and wait for the order management platform to return a confirmation of that order to me. All good so far. But if we think about what happens... What has to happen in the back end, we have multiple different systems that are going to deal with be dealing with that order amongst other processes. So we have an inventory process, for instance. Um, we have a shipping process. Probably we want to update our customer relationship system too. So we could call these synchronously API after API after API, but in the event-driven world, we take a different approach. So first of all, we need an infrastructural layer to deal with this. That's called an event broker. Um, and what we need to do there is rather than think of this as a sequence of calls, what we're going to do is we're going to communicate changes. So our order management system is probably going to emit an order that says something like order created. And our event broker is then going to decide who is listening to that event based on who's subscribing to it, who's, who's interested in it. Our inventory system may then say, oh, OK, I've got an order. I'm going to allocate some stock. And notice the focus there, it's up to the inventory system to decide what that event means for it, not for the order management system to describe what it wants from the inventory. And you can see that works for shipping as well, for instance. So uh, maybe once, uh, once some stock has been allocated and the order has been processed, order processed, invoice paid, that's another event from the order management platform. Maybe then it's going to say, OK, well, I'm now ready to ship this parcel, whatever it is, uh, and then issue a product shipped. Um, or order shipped event. Interesting, the CRM system there. You can see that actually CRM probably doesn't have any kind of in sequence um, role to play here. It's just listening to all of these interactions. So notice here we've got both the REST APIs, the synchronous request response style APIs on the left, and the event driven APIs on the right. As Patrick was saying, we see these as completely complementary. They are not, uh, it's not one or the other. So where do we use this? Well, REST APIs are good for peer-to-peer -peer data exchange. They're also great for um, passing of control. So when I'm a customer and I place an order, I'm passing control over that process to the order management system. Event-driven APIs are more about one-to-many distribution of data. So you can see the order management application here is, is emitting events, and it doesn't know who's listening to them. That's the event broker's job. Event-driven is also best for time-sensitive information. Okay, so if you think about e-commerce, it's all about time. You've got to get the customer's order placed as quickly as possible, right? Because otherwise you get a high drop out of it. If we extend this, what about other stakeholders inside and outside our organization? So in the example down at the right-hand side there, that might be our shipping fulfillment partner, our DHL or, F uh, uh, or FedEx of the world. Well, they might be interested in some of these updates too. So in the shipping case, uh, shipment ready, that might be super, super useful for our fulfillment part. part right? But the key thing here is that when we're talking to our external stakeholders, whether they're external to the company or just across the line of business, what we really want is a way of um, having a single easy to consume entity that they can uh, 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 use. So we need a way of managing both our REST APIs. Well, that's kind of already done with API gateways and developer portals. And we need a way of managing our event-driven APIs too. So if we look at the idea of these event APIs, how we might manage them and how we might create them as products then. Well, first of all, we need to understand what these event API products are. So let's look at a kind of a, a 
this view here, where we talk about the producing applications on the left-hand side. So with our order management system, that's got a REST front end, and it's producing different events, like order received, order processed, order shipped. Look at our warehouse system, it's the same. We might be allocating stock. There may be a product that's, that's come into stock that was previously out of stock. We might have a product catalog, for instance. We may have new products or deprecated products there. And our marketing team may be launching promotions. And you can see that we've got all of these events associated with them. But now if we start talking about this business capability view of thing, that's our applications on the right-hand side. So you can imagine our delivery service provider might be interested in knowing when an order has been placed, uh, whether they're stock lightly, so does he start scheduling shipment or maybe he has to delay it? Um, um, what happens when the shipment system is finally happy that it's created a shipment and sent it to them? So you can see that there, our delivery service provider is having to subscribe, because that's how we get events, to multiple events. Hmm. Okay. We could say the same about our inventory management application. Um, he's having to listen, to listen to stock availabilities and when, when new products are introduced. Um, let's imagine that we're, we're trying to interface with an external party, maybe a price comparison website, for instance, is perhaps, if we're lucky, even willing to pay um, for some of this data when a new product is available, whether there's a, a promotion launch, maybe our marketing team want to send that data to them. And again, there's multiple, uh, multiple events there. In terms of this idea of monetizing um, uh, events. Uh, another example might be the connected car use case, right? If you think about your whole kind of street view in Google Maps, they had to drive cars around with these big detectors on the roof, measuring and taking pictures of streets. Now, if you think about cars these days, they've got collision detection with LiDAR, they've got uh, uh, lane detection with cameras. All of that infrastructure is now built into the cars you're buying. Imagine what the car vendor could do, your car manufacturer could do, if they could take that data and sell it to third parties to build these kind of mapping applications. It gives you an idea of what we can do with this. Okay, so we've got this idea of event API products where we're going to bundle, if I go back to the previous slide, if we look at a delivery service provider, they're going to want to receive these various different order management system and warehousing events. We want to bundle these together into a single coherent whole. We then want to be able to manage that, right? And, and that gives us the ability to curate the data in there and expose it in an easy to consume way to whoever wants to receive it. And of course, the point here with them being event APIs is that this is high value, real time data, right? So let's look at our um, uh, uh, shipping example. We've got our events that we're going to ship. Well, we could call that a single order status product. Rather, as Patrick was saying in the previous um, presentation, he introduced the idea of async API. That's an open specification, a bit like open API is for REST APIs. Async API is to uh, event APIs. It's an, it's an open specification that enables you to easily transfer information about how you would consume or produce these events. Uh, and you can see, you know, maybe we can bundle up our uh, uh, stock kind of um, events into an inventory API product in much the same way. And we can do the same with our kind of product comparison idea too. So I'm hoping you're getting the idea here of how we can bundle together multiple events as event products and then ship them as an event API product to, to whoever wishes to consume them in a very easy to do way. So that's introducing kind of what event API products are and, and how, how we can kind of compose them. If you look at the value view of this, you can imagine that you've got a whole load of system events. So these are your technical level events. So let's take an example of interface statements, status, for example, that you might consume on some internal dashboard um, to show you how well your services are running. Well, that's all very well and good. That's vital, probably, but it's not something that's really going to be exposed outside of that domain. But we can say that some events will be exposed to other domains too. So we kind of elevate the value of those events to kind of an enterprise level. So in our um, e-commerce example, for instance, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, uh, order shipped, um, could be ready to sell events, for instance. And that's all well and understood. But now when we bring this product idea, what we're gonna do is bundle those events together and then present them to customers via a developer portal using these open standards, right? And as you can see, as we go up this kind of value stack, 
the value of the events to you as an organization and to your external partners increases, but the amount of exposure that these events have, and what that means is the amount of management and curation that we need to do to them also increases too. Okay, so how are we actually going to do this? Well, event brokers are a little different to, a little different to API gateways in that they don't really have this same registration um, uh, approach. So put simply, you produce an event, people subscribe to the event. There's no kind of real registration. There's only really a kind of an authentication. Once you're into the platform, you can start subscribing. That's just the nature of the beast. So we need to know what events are flowing and we need to, dis we need to discover those. Once we know what events we have, we have to start assessing them. So looking at, you know, is this a uh, domain specific event or is it something we can elevate up the value chain as I described previously? So once we've done that, once we've kind of assessed our events, we can start thinking about what kind of products we can build on top of them. So that's the curation phase. We're gonna add documentation to them as a bundle, not just documentation as an individual event. So this bundle does this. And now we've got our product, we've bundled our events together and we've described them. So now we can release them to our customers, we can expose and publish them. And you, you know, as is typical in this space, you're not finished there. Um, what you need to do on top of that is start managing them. So if somebody comes in and wants to change the system event for a very good reason, they have to know that actually that's going to impact an API product, right? So we need to, we need to evolve our products, we need to optimize them, and we need to govern them. So how do we go about this? Well, let's take the discovery phase to start with. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to segue briefly here. So uh, the way we do this in Solis is where, with our event portal. So I've talked about the idea of the event broker being the runtime, like your API gateway, and the event portal being your, your developer portal, your uh, any point exchange or, or, or however you communicate with your particular API system. Now, it's important to note that in Solis, we see our event portal uh, as, as uh, uh, event broker agnostic. So you can see on the left hand side there, we talk to the PubSub Plus broker from Solis and Kafka brokers, the Confluent broker, that kind of thing. And the idea behind it is much like a developer portal. It's a single place where architects, developers, and the product managers can communicate and manage their events, the payload structure, and all those things. Here's an example view. This is the developer view here. So you can see some applications that are com communicating via events. So how are we going to go through this process that I've just mentioned? Well, first of all, we're going to run our source discovery agent against your event broker to pull in all of these events. Um, we're gonna upload them to the portal and start associating them with their applications and specific application domains. Now, once we've done that, we're in a good place because now we can start visualizing the event flows and we can start documenting them. And once we've done that, we can move into our cataloging phase and now we start moving into the event product phase because we can start doing our assessment and our curation. We can add documentation to our events, we can decide who the owner is, that kind of thing, and we can start seeing how we're gonna elevate specific events up that value chain. Once we've done that, we know events we wish to expose. Here's the feature whereby you can select those events and add them to your event API product. And you can describe, for instance, whether this in this particular product, you're going to be sending those events to people or whether as a feature of this product, you need to subscribe, you need to receive those events. Now, being kind of fully event driven here, we're not going to start shipping out um, um, specifications as, as flat, uh, uh, simple files. So the way we're going to expose these event API products is through the API, uh, async API standard. And rather than, our, rather than just download um, an async API standard at the particular time that this product was created, what we're gonna do is give you an API where you could call and get the latest version of the async API specification. Or indeed, if you want, we can actually host that for you on our cloud platform. And that's kind of, that deals with the release phase, right? We're now released to um, your API product consumers. Now, a key point here is that one of the features of the portal is that if you start changing events that are part of an API product, we'll tell you about it and we enable you to look at the effects of downstream changes on events, for instance. So there we have it. I've introduced the idea of what an event API product is and we've kind of mapped that to the API world. 
Um, and perhaps you've seen that, you know, there is a product layer event portal that helps you do all of this governance and, and, and creating these event API products. Um, it really is one of the first to market. Um, you can see their IDC have kind of highlighted that point. It gives you that ability to create an event API product, but also to manage it, to govern it, to pull it in right from the lowest level of looking inside your event broker, seeing the events and, and moving all the way up that value chain to exposing them to your customers. Okay, that's all I had to say in 20 minutes. I think I've hit that more or less on the button, which I'm quite pleased about. Um, I'm hoping to go to any questions now. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, thank you, Tom. Um, real, real quickly, one question. Um, you, you, you covered a subject that is probably a, a bigger discussion, fairly briefly. Uh, but you said that the event portal is event broker agnostic. Um, mm. can, you, can you explore that a little further, and and where do you see that going in the future? Yeah, sure. So that's a good question. Um, so yeah, we want it to be broker agnostic. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means at the moment we're developing our own interfaces to other brokers. So for instance, if you wanted to in, in, uh, uh, integrate with something like Apache Kafka, you can. Um, but what we're planning to do is create essentially a plug-in um, capability. Um, and then what we're hoping to do is open source the uh, plugins. Um, so that you can see how the existing plugins work. And if you have uh, a particular product that you'd like to integrate with, you could write your own uh, uh, plugin as well. Um, yeah, so that's so, yeah, it's a developing space, but uh, hopefully you can see that, yeah, we're really committed to this idea of being, of being, being agnostic to the event broker underneath. Uh, I imagine there's a number of people who, are, who, are, who heard you say open source. Uh, and we're thrilled to hear that. So um, <laughs> exactly, yeah. To be clear, that's the that's the plugin aspect that we're planning to open source. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you you talked us through um, sort of a five step building block model. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask about step two. Um, there's the the the, the once you've discover go through the discovery, and then step two is that that assessment of value. If, mm -hmm. if you were advising me, um, and I was a a client or I was a, an e commerce platform owner, for example, would you advise us to start with a low value? Uh, product to sort of practice and, and develop the muscle memory, or do we do, or do we start with the high value product area first? So, well, typically when people engage, right, they typically already have a product uh, project in mind. Okay. Um, so certainly for kind of a POC stage, maybe you could look at a low value uh, low value kind of API. But kind of closing the name, that's not going to prove the value of it. That's going to prove the technical capability to do it. So if you want to prove the technical capability, sure, start with a lower value, maybe simpler API as part of the POC perhaps. But I would say your first project, that's probably going to be customer driven. That's probably going to be driven by a project. So it should be entirely driven by that, right? Okay. Um, and and I, I asked this, this, this question of Patrick also because as the... Uh, uh, a, a, as a security professional myself, um, can you talk about how the um, event-driven concept, um, what, what should security teams or infrastructure teams that are your, your peers on left and right, what, what should they understand about this design paradigm uh, so that they can shift their approach as well? Yeah, so it's a bit scary, right? All of a sudden, you've got this new way of transmitting events and, and somebody can just come in and register an interest and all of a sudden they start getting data and is that applicable to them? And should they have that data? What if there's GDPR? What if there's uh, personal identifying information in it? So there are two stages to this. We'll take the whole kind of authentication um, piece as, as given, right? You're not really in the game if you can't do things um, like integrating with Active Directory or OAuth, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, really, the key point around the, the event-driven space is who's, who's able to access certain events. So the key there is that part of this publish-subscribe paradigm is this idea of uh, topics and subscriptions. So a topic is a descriptor of this event, this piece of data that you've sent around. And so that's the key. That's where you do your security. So you, you allocate to Carl. Um, you can listen to Tom's API date docs, but you can't listen to Tom's, uh, I don't know, payslips. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because I can tag a payslip with the fact that this is a payslip. I can then use my security infrastructure on my event broker to say payslips should only go to the person that they're, they're supposed to go to. 
And on that note, then is that is that related? Um, I guess directly to the comment you made that a, a broker is not really a, a, an API gateway, and so our API management gateways don't really have a role to play here. Is that is that is that an accurate read, or could you maybe uh, share that thought again? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that. I'd say an API gateway is an analogous to an event broker. Okay. They're doing the same job. An API gateway is for synchronous events. An event broker is for um, asynchronous events. Um, so I wouldn't say there's there's no real space for an API gateway there. Yep. Definitely, um, uh, you know, they're fulfilling different needs in a, uh, a complementary way. So we can connect API gateways to our event broker mm -hmm. to receive updates based on what's going on in the API gateway, for instance. Wonderful. Um, Tom, uh, fascinating. And just a, a, a question that was uh, asked on the chat. So yes, these uh, these talks will be available. I think we have a, a few days until they're, they're posted um, for review. But uh, Tom, of course, I think we have uh, several in the audience who are going to want to watch your watch your talk over and over again um, uh, to, to let it sink in and, and compile. So thank you so much for joining us, Tom. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you.